introducing Dr. Joy Hardiman, the executive director of our Tacoma campus, who will do the introduction. Joy has, Joy has held the position of executive director since 1990. Um, this will be her final year in that role as she goes on sabbatical and goes back to teaching and doing marvelous things. But the wonderful thing about Joy is, even as an administrator, she's always maintained that hunger and has continued to teach. Um, she has made incredible gains and in growth in our Tacoma campus. Her teaching philosophy focuses on using ancient wisdom to explore an envisioned solution to contemporary problems. She's an international executive board member of the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilizations. She was a summer Fulbright scholar and has done extensive field work on African presence in global history. She's a brilliant conceptualist and an extraordinarily inspirational teacher. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hardman. my great honor and privilege to introduce Dr. Maya Angelou to you tonight. She is a woman who speaks six languages, is the author of seven autobiographies, 12 books of poetry, six plays, two screenplays, three spoken word albums, and multiple TV and film appearances. She is a woman whose legendary wisdom spans time and continents. Dr. Maya Angelou is a woman who embodies the essence of the classical African ancient Egyptian creative mandate as voiced by Queen Hatshepsut, who wrote on the walls of her temple in the Valley of the Kings, I take as my sacred mission to devote my life to restoring that which is in ruin and make it more beautiful than before. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Angelo is a restorer and a transformer. She is a woman whose practice is based in the ancestral connection to the African concept of Heka, which is the evocative power of language to accomplish what one wills, as taught in the great universities of Timbuktu and Sangai and Jenna. Dr. Angelo uses words as nets to catch and restore and renew our spirit and soul. She is a woman who stands on the shoulders and walks in the tradition of such great African storytellers and writers as Isak, Dumas, Pushkin, Langston Hughes, and Zora Neale Hurston. She tells the story of common folks in a way that allows us to see their and our humanity. She is a person who reminds us that sun's rises always follow sunsets, that human beings are verbs and not nouns, and that we're all miracles in the process of becoming. So join me in welcoming author, poet, historian, educator, actress, playwright, director, civil rights activist, producer, <laughs>
love you back. When it looked like the sun wasn't shine anymore, God put a rainbow in the clouds. She does not know her beauty. She thinks her brown body has no glory. If she could dance naked under palm trees and see her image in the river, she would know. But there are no palm trees on the street and dishwater gives back no images. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> Still, when it looked like the sun wasn't gonna shine anymore. Once riding in old Baltimore, my head was filled, my heart was filled with glee. I saw a Baltimorean keep looking straight at me. Now I was eight and very small and she was no whit bigger. And so I smiled, but she stuck out her tongue and called me nigga. She said, you little black, no good nigga, mm. She said, dirty little rascal nigga, mm. I saw the whole of Baltimore from May on this, until December. And of all the things that happened there, that's all that I remember. Mm, mm, mm. Still. When it looked like the sun wasn't gonna shine anymore. Miss Rosie, when I see you, you black, brown, beige, red, yellow, pink, white, sad of a woman. When I see you, Miss Rosie, sitting waiting for your mind, like last week's groceries. I say, when I see you, Miss Rosie, you in the old man's shoes with the big toes cut out, when I see you, who used to be the prettiest gal in Georgia, used to be called Georgia Rose, when I see you, Miss Rosie, because of your dedication, your devotion, your intelligence, your courage, and your love, I stand up. Miss Rosie, I stand straight up, and I know when it looked like the sun wasn't gonna shine anymore. Miss Rosie, you became my rainbow in the clouds. Thank you. Evergreen, I come to you with a light and lighted heart. My days these days are not light, but I was coming to Evergreen. And so knowing I was coming here, I knew I was coming to a rainbow in the cloud. Some of you don't know this, but uh, the Dr. Mims, who was mentioned by your president, Dr. Purse, Dr. Mims is a sister friend of mine, and she invited me here all those years ago. She had been a professor at the university, and she realized that there was a, an evergreen uh, Olympia, but there was, I mean, there was not a place for poor black men and women over 18 and poor Native American and poor white and pure, poor Latino. 
men and women, to visit, to go to school, she began to harass the state. <laughs> And she, this black woman, began evergreen in her kitchen. The, the, uh, the uh, Tacoma uh, uh, branch was begun in her kitchen. And when there, there, so many people came, blacks and whites, Spanish-speaking and Native American, she broke the wall between the kitchen and the dining room. <laughs> I know that uh, Maxine Mims is a rainbow in the clouds. And because I know that, because I know that, I know that Evergreen is one. So having you to look forward to made it possible for me in the last few weeks to, uh, to live with a, a world where a beautiful sister friend of mine uh, has left. And of course, when anybody leaves, all those you've lost leave again. And so, but I kept thinking, I'm going to Evergreen. <laughs> yes, this is who we are. Each one of us is. Young man, young woman, older man, old, or, or as my, my doctor trying to get on my good side said of me, upper, edel, upper middle age. <laughs> I was so pleased, I said, I'll do anything you say. <laughs> so, this is who we really are. So I thought, since I, I mean, I do believe in preaching to the choir. I know you are already converted. But uh, I, I do believe, so I decided to talk to you about rainbows in the clouds for the next three or four hours. I hope you brought everything you need. Now wait. Wait. I have to sit down from time to time I always, for many years, I have had a, a very bad right knee. I mean, it was known as the bad knee. And people who didn't even know me would come up, Dr. Angelo, how's the bad knee? But my left knee was very good. About six months ago, my left knee began to feel sympathetic to the right knee. And so both of them are horrid. So uh, my hosts, have put this uh, chair, this stool up here for me, and I will use it. I'm sorry for my darlings just in front of here. In fact, if the microphone could be moved, if I had a stand-up mic, I could just use that. I, but never mind. I mean, um, anyway, I'm here and I intend, I came here to say something and I'm not going to leave until I say it. So there we are. I will not. So from time to time I will stand up and then I'll perch and I'll stand up. But to talk about rainbows in the clouds, each one of us has had rainbows in our clouds. Whether the ancestors came from Eastern Europe trying to escape the, the pogroms, the little and large murders, arriving at Ellis Island, having their names changed to something utterly unpronounceable. <laughs> or if the ancestors came from Scandinavia, from Italy, Hungary, South America, Mexico, trying to find a place that would hold all the people, all the faces. Or if the ancestors came from New and old Delhi, uh, if they came from Asia in the 19th century to build this country, to build the railroads, unable legally to bring their mates for decades, 
or indeed if they came from Africa unwillingly, lying spoon fashion, that means back to belly, in the filthy hatches of slave ships, and in their own and in each other's excrement, and urine, and menstrual flow, they have paid for each of us already. You see? We have always had rainbows in our clouds. Whether they had a chance of ever knowing what our names would be, or what our faces would look like, or what mad personalities we would foist upon the world. <laughs> they have paid for us. And so it's a wonderful thing to honor those who have paid for you. If you know their names, you must honor them by saying their names aloud. If you don't know their names, thanks for what you've done for me, whoever you were. You must do it. People live in direct relation to the heroes and sheroes they have. Always and in all ways. So if a song of the Beatles helped you to see the light, if a song of B.B. King or Aretha Franklin helped you to understand something, if Tim McGraw or Faith hit, no, true, true, isn't it? No, no, I'm telling you. I'm an aficionada of uh, country music. And so, and so I do the country music television about once a year. And the last time I was asked to come and introduce Miss uh, Martina McBride, and they asked would I work, walk on the red carpet. Well, walking is difficult with these ridiculous, stupid knees. And, uh, and I, I said, oh, you know, those people are waiting for Toby Keith and all the, you know, some of the wild ones, the big and rich and so on. And, uh, and why should I walk on? I said, no, I will do it. I walked on the red carpet and those people who would like that on either side said, Tell we love you. <laughs> and when I got to the, to the theater, to the uh, Opryland, Ryman, and went out to introduce uh, Martina McBride, I don't know, 15,000 or 20,000 people stood to greet me. Now, what that tells me is, you don't have to be the uh, rainbow in the clouds to people who look just like you. Hello. <laughs> you may have enough intelligence and courage to look through complexion and see community. Hello. <laughs> so. So being a rainbow in the clouds is the most noble thing we can be, you see? To people who, who may not call God the same name we call God, if they call God at all. But to be a rainbow in the clouds. So I thought I'd speak to you about my, some of the rainbows I know. But this is just some. When I was three and my brother five, my mother and father we lived in Southern California. My mother and father agreed to disagree. They separated and they even divorced. Now I know there are people who say what a pity and a shame the result of a, of a divorced family are. And it's true, sometimes. But then sometimes we ought to get a grip. Some people ought to be divorced. <laughs> My mother and father did my nation a favor <laughs> by getting that way. Liberated us all, thank the Lord. Their next moves were not so swift. They put me and Bailey on, on a train in Los Angeles with tags around on our arms. No adult supervision. I was three, Bailey was five. The tag said, these children are to be delivered to Mrs. Annie Henderson in Stamps, Arkansas. 
Stamps, I can tell you, it's a village about the size, a little bit larger than this stage, right? <laughs> Not as large as the gym. Uh, because of the kind uh, offices of the dining car waiters and the Pullman car porters, we actually arrived in that village. I can't believe it. It's over 70 years ago. And they, they took us off trains and put us on others. And, and we arrived in this teeny little village with my grandma, my father's mother, uh, and her other child, my Uncle Willie. Now, they owned the only black-owned store in the town. And they needed me and Bailey to work in the store. I mean, my Uncle Willie was crippled. His whole right side was paralyzed. His left side was huge because in that side of the family, we grow to be very tall and broad and all. Uh, my grandmother was old by the time we got there. I mean, she must have been 50. <laughs> so, they needed a, I think my grandmother taught me to read that afternoon when I first. <laughs> But my Uncle Willie taught me my times tables. And he would grab me this, with this strong, big left side and stand me in front of a pot-bellied stove with fire in it. And he'd say, now, sister, with the slur attendant to his paralysis, he'd say, sister, now do your eight, sis. Sister, do your nine, sis. Sister, do your tens. I learned my multiplication tables exquisitely. <laughs> I was so sure if I didn't, somehow he would manage to open that pot belly stove, <laughs> throw me in it, and of course I found out he was so tender hearted, he wouldn't allow a spider or a fly to be killed in the store. <laughs> Bailey and I had to catch the offender and take it outside where he thought we would kill it. Maybe we did, I didn't know. But he would take me. So Uncle Willie taught me to do my times tables. I'm sorry to say my Uncle Willie died some years ago. So I went down to Stamps to see about affairs. I stopped in Little Rock and a woman came out to the airport, a great American, a, 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 a treasure. Miss Daisy Bates. Now, if you don't know her, get on your Google, <laughs> go Google, and, and find her, Daisy Bates. She's a woman, the black woman, who led the nine children into the Central High School in Little Rock, causing the governor to come out and play the, show the pure fool that he was. <laughs> Governor Orva Faubus said, over my dead body, the governor of the state, can you say, he didn't want black children to kill him because he had disagreed with God's choice for the colors of the people's skin. <laughs> so, so he stood up, which caused uh, President Ike Eisenhower to send down the federal troops to look after those nine kids. It's an interesting story. Get on your Google and go Google. <laughs> anyway, she met me at the airport. I didn't have to tell you she was black, because here's what you said, girl. <laughs> girl, I know you're down here on your way to stamps, but there's somebody dying to meet you, and I want to bring him to your hotel, okay? So I said, okay. She brought about 30 people to my hotel. <laughs> but, but she brought this black man who was all of that. <laughs> so I said, how do you do? He said, I don't want to shake your hand. I want to hug you. I said, I sure appreciate it. He <laughs> gave me a wonderful hug. He said, now you're down here in Arkansas because Willie has died. My jaw fell to my chest. What? This man in a three-piece suit way up north in Little Rock had even heard of my Uncle Willie? Uncle Willie was so ashamed of being crippled that he wouldn't even go to Louisville, Arkansas, which was five miles from Stamps 
and the county seat. This man up in, in Little Rock, up north, in a three-piece suit, he said, you know, because of your Uncle Willie, I'm who I am today. He said, you know, in the 30s, I was the only child of a blind mother. Your Uncle Willie gave me a job in your store and paid me 10 cents a week and made me love to learn. And uh, he taught me my times table. <laughs> I asked him, how did he do it? He said, he used to grab me right here. <laughs> he said, because of him, I'm who I am today. You want to know who that is? I said, yes, sir. He said, I'm mayor of Little Rock, Arkansas. <laughs> One of the first blacks in the South. I looked at Willie. I thought, my Lord. Would he ever even know how far the light of his rainbow shone? He said, now, uh, because of him and what I learned and who I've become, I have a police escort for you to take you from Little Rock, convoy you from Little Rock to Stamps, Arkansas. He said, now, um, I want you to stop in Louisville, because there's a good old boy, he'll look after your property. And I called him, I called him. I went downstairs the next morning, and I was thrown back, I don't know how many years, to being eight, six, when the boys would ride in stamps. That's just how they would, it would be told, be careful, the boys are going to ride tonight. Uh, my brother and I would take the potatoes and onions out of a bin and help my Uncle Willie to get down into that bin. And we'd cover him with potatoes and onions. It was dangerous for any black man to be extant on a night when the boys would ride. We would cover him with potatoes and onions and then look out the window Outside, the boys, they were men on horseback, and they'd stomp around in front of the store. They didn't wear sheets. They didn't have to. They were the law. So to whom could anybody protest? The next morning in Little Rock, Arkansas, I went downstairs, and there were eight white men, just looking just like the boys. They had huge guns which set up. I couldn't believe it. I started to cry and to laugh. I went to each one, I shook his hand and gave him a big kiss. <laughs> I said, I want to thank you in the name of my Uncle Willie. Dead still being the rainbow in my cloud. You see? I had this story goes on because it, well, uh, I stopped in Louisville to see this lawyer. And the mayor had said, he's a good old boy. He'll look after your property. I expected an older black man with uh, dignity and many years to speak to me, older than our president, uh, but looking much like a, uh, at an authority in control. <laughs> I mean, this president. <laughs> Just in case. Just in case you all thought I didn't know I was in Washington State. <laughs> There's a young man, young white man, ran out of the office. He said, Dr. Angelo, I'm just delighted to see you. <laughs> he said, the mayor coming from Little Rock, he's the only, the strongest, most powerful black man I ever met. He's a noble man. Dr. Angelo, because of him, I'm who I am today.
I said, oh, let me sit down and eat. <laughs> he said, um, I'm the only child of a deaf mother. Mr. Bussey, the mayor, caught hold of me when I was 11 years old and made me understand how important it was for me to get an education for me and my mother. And Dr. Angelo, I'm not just in the a, 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 a lawyer, I'm in the state legislature. I look back at Willie. You see? Poor, black, male, during the lynching years, and crippled more so. I have no idea the width, the breadth, the height that his, uh, where his rainbow has shown. In fact, last month, in Washington, D.C. There was a groundbreaking for the memorial for Martin Luther King. And I was one of the speakers. I spoke and when I finished, a young white man with his wife came plunging through with children. He said, Dr. Angelo, Dr. Angelo, wait a minute, I want to speak to you. So I said, yes, yeah, fine. He said, uh, my family, we are, we, are, are we all tied together. So I said, ah. Oh. He said, many years ago, uh, I think my grandfather was able to be of help to you. So I said, oh. He said, yes, he's uh, in, uh, in, he was then in Louisville, Arkansas. He's a, he was a lawyer and in the state legislature. I asked him in your family name, he said, Pryor, which is the name of the young man. I told this story before, but I never mentioned his name because I didn't want to violate his privacy. But the young man came. He said, and Dr. Angelo, Mr. Bussey, who was the mayor, was very kind to my grandfather. And I want you to know that I am a congressman. <laughs> Willie! See? So never underestimate who you are or what you are. I wrote a song for Miss Roberta Flack. I write for some singers from time to time. But this song, she sings it better than I do. But uh, I wrote it. And I wrote it for all of us. Willie was a man without fame. Hardly anybody knew his name. Crippled and limping and always walking lame. He said, I keep on moving and moving just the same. Solitude was the climate in his head. Emptiness was the partner in his bed. Pain and cold in the steps of his tread. He said, I keep on following where the others lay. I will cry and I will die, but my spirit is the soul of every spring. Look for me and you will see that I'm present in the songs that children sing. People call him uncle, boy, and hey. Said, you can't live through this another day. And then he waited to hear what he would say. He said, I'll be living in the games that children play. You may enter my sleep. You may people my dreams and threaten my early morning's ease. But I keep coming. I'm following. I'm laughing. I'm crying. I'm certain as a summer breeze. Look for me. Look out for me. My spirit is the surge of open seas. Call for me, call upon me. I'm the rustle in the autumn leaves. When the sun rises, I am the time. When the children live and learn and laugh and love, I am the rhyme. You can just call me Cripple Willie. That's who we are. That's just who we are, each one of us. 
We've already had the rainbows in our clouds or we wouldn't be here. And that's just who we are. We are rainbows. We have the possibility of shining on a path that was very crooked and helping to make it a little straighter for people who are yet to come on a path that was really terribly bumpy, dangerous, and uh, smoothing out the way for someone who is yet to come. Um, I'm, I'm flooded with things I want to tell you. Um, I'm not either, and I thank you. I thank you, baby. Years ago, I used to keep, um, I used to write, I had a flat in uh, London, and I used to write there. So I would go there for three or four months at a time, and I would work from midnight till about seven, and then I would take a shower and go out and try to let some of the ideas fresh air ideas come into my brain. One morning, I was walking down King's Road, it was about 7.30, and a little chilly, and I was walking down King's Road, and there were two young people sitting with their backs against the store. I, I simply recorded them. They had their little dog, their little brown dog, we all know that dog, he was here in Seattle. He was in San Francisco, in, down in the village in New York. This little dog, they had two guitars, backpacks, and I simply saw them. Before I could reach them, a man came out of the shop, which means he'd gone around to come in through the back, and he turned and he spat on these two young people. I don't mean he spat, I mean he cleared his throat and spat on these two young people. Now, they were white, he was white. He couldn't tell if those children were English or Irish or Welsh. He, they could have been Scandinavian or Hungarian or Italian. He didn't, I knew they were mine. I, I, I couldn't stand it. Now, I'm not much of a cursor. That's not, that's not one of my arts. There is an art to it, but, but I went to him and I just took his lapels and I started talking. And I didn't know all that I was saying. <laughs> I said, you knock me, slew footed, chili eating, I don't know what you're doing. I put ridges on my lips, you know. <laughs> the man turned and ran inside. The children, they started gathering all their belongings. They never spoke a word to me, so I never find out where, where they were from. But I did go home, and again, I wrote a song. When you see them on the freeway hitching rides With their dogs and their guitars by their sides You need to ask, What's on the lying and the dying and the killing and the thrilling all about? Take time out. When you see him with a band around his head and an army trump make up break up that makes his bed, you need to ask, what's all the beating and the cheating and the bleeding and the needing all about? Take time out. Take a minute, feel some sorrow for the folks who thought tomorrow was a place that they could call up on the phone. Take a month and show some kindness for the folks who thought that blindness was an illness that affected eyes alone. When you see her walking barefoot in the rain and you know she's tripping on a one-way train, you need to ask, what's all the yelling and the selling the beating and the cheating all about. Take time out. Oh, you can sell your soul for money, then run off to the country for your cookouts and your parties on the lawns. While our children seek sedation in Eastern meditation, 
or visions that go shooting up their arms when you know that youth is dying on the run and my daughter trades dope stories with your son we need to ask what's all the warring and the jarring the killing and the thrilling the beating and the cheating the bleeding and the needing all about we better take time It was my intention to read to you a whole lot of poetry. And I, I've been talking poetry, but to read it to you because it's so important. And I want you at Evergreen, at Olympia campus, and at the Tacoma campus, I want you to please reinstitute the habit of memorizing poetry. Please. Memorize some poetry. Um, I would like to think that you would memorize some Angelo. <laughs> and some Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Yes, I'm going I'm to say some Dunbar to you. And uh, some Shakespeare. I want you to have it. You'll need it. Uh, I love Edgar Allan Poe myself. I love Poe so much, I call him Eep. <laughs> I lied to myself in a familiar way. I have to tell you this. All those years later, when I returned to my mother in San Francisco, I was 13. And I had spent six years as a, as a volunteer mute. And uh, I returned to my mother, and my mother was a strange bird. <laughs> she thought all children should go to see at least two plays a year, and there should be Bach in the house and blues. Uh, she liked... Uh, um, all the old blues singers, I mean, she had them. Arthur Big Boy crewed up, and really old blues, and Bach. It was very nice. <laughs> you didn't know what you'd wake up to. <laughs> the great chords in the universe are, they please don't go. <laughs> At one time, she, she had tickets to the Curran Theater, and four great famous um, American movie stars were going to come and read poetry. So she had tickets and we went, Bailey and I. Tyrone Power, Gregory Peck, Ann Baxter, and Agnes Moorhead. And the two women came out in dark black dresses with pearls. <laughs> and uh, the two men in dark suits and tuxedos. And they had podia, four podia and they each read. And then I saw in the, uh, in the program that Gregory Peck was going to do The Raven. Now, I had never heard it uh, uh, read or anything, but I, had, I knew it and memorized it. And because of the internal rhyme, I had memorized it in the 40s, much like the hip hop people speak today. So I had understood it to mean once upon a midnight dreary, as I pondered weak and weary <laughs> over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. Had I nodded just like napping, suddenly I heard a tapping as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. Tis some visitor I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Gregory Peck came out and he took that, that Shakespearean stance, you know, that Shakespearean actors do. And, and said, once upon a midnight dreary, as I pondered, weak, and 
weary. I said, that's not the way that plays. I had, uh, I, up in St. Louis, I had been, when I was seven, I was taken there from my grandmother in Arkansas. I was taken up there to my mother's family. And uh, her family were extremely erudite and sophisticated and educated. <laughs> and they took a little bit. <laughs> they even called baloney, balona. Well, I mean, my brother and I were trying to get to be city kids. I mean, tried to learn to talk like that. We ate c sliced bread and, and liverwurst and things like that. But my mother's boyfriend raped me. I told the name of the rapist to my brother, who told it to the family. The man was put in jail for one day and released, one day and night. And about three days later, uh, the police came to my mother's mother's house, her, into her parlor floor, where Bailey and I were playing a game. We called it Monopoly, because we never heard it for now. <laughs> when, when the police came in, and, uh, and there were two huge policemen, and white, and they had uh, blue serge uniforms. In the 30s, blue serge was about a quarter of an inch thick if not thicker. And they had huge brass buttons like that, shining like new money. They looked like giants to me. And they told my mother's mother that the man had been found dead. And it seemed he had been kicked to death. I thought my voice killed the man. So for everybody's sake, it was better if I didn't speak. So I stopped. Then, traumatized, finished. My mother's people did their best to woo me away from my mutism. They sang, they did everything. But I wouldn't. So after about three months, they sent me and Bailey back to Stamps, Arkansas, this little village, to Mama. And I'd love you to see Mama. I may even, fa even finish tonight with Mama. Mama uh, was like everybody's grandma. I mean, she could have been Korean, she could have been Irani, she could have been Senegalese, she could have been Irish. Here's Mama, Japanese. <laughs> Mama, right? When I returned to Mama, my Mama would braid my hair the way old black ladies still braid girls' hair. The Mama sits down on the chair and pulls her dress way down between her legs like that. And the girl sits on a pillow and both of them face out. The girl tries to get back close to Mama. And my hair was huge <laughs> and very curly. So Mama had her, her work cut out for her. She'd bend her hand like that and put it behind my neck so she wouldn't break my neck by accident. <laughs> and she started to brush all this hair. She says, Sister Mama don't care what these people say about you must be an idiot or you must be a moron because you can't talk. Sister Mama don't care. Mama know when you and the good Lord get ready. Sister, you're gonna be a teacher. I used to sit there and think this poor ignorant mama. <laughs> Doesn't she know I will never speak? <laughs> I thank uh, uh, my hosts, both the president and, and Sister Joy, Dr. Joy Hargrove. I thank you, and I thank you all. I thank them for being fairly brief in the <laughs> But, um, Sometimes when I'm being introduced, I, I feel I'm at my own wake. You know, people say, and then in 1940, she did so and so. The truth is, uh, 
I now have over 60 doctorates. Now wait now, wait now, wait a minute. And uh, I teach in Spanish and French all over the world, and theology and uh, philosophy and so forth. The truth is, I am able to be here because of the rainbows in my clouds. My grandmother was a rainbow in my cloud. My Uncle Willie was a rainbow in my clouds. I mean, it was cloudy. Yeah, my brother has been a rainbow in my clouds, all now dead, still lighting up the way for me. When I'm most lonely, I feel most threatened. I think of them. I bring them right into the theater with me. They're here in this gym. Everyone that I, who ever loved me, who ever said, morning, who knew me or didn't know me, and said, how are you, hi. You have no idea what that can mean to somebody. You can see a person, she may have just hung up the phone from having a nurse say, uh, we would like you to come back in. We, we weren't sure. We want to read that again. Each time you say, morning, you have no idea. When somebody just heard from an employer, look, we're going to downsize, Mr. Jones. I'm sorry to say we'd like you to come in and get your belongings. Ah. And for a moment, you've said, hello, hi. You have no idea what you've done. Just for a second, the person is lifted up. She says, is she going to my church? <laughs> For a brief moment, you've lifted somebody up who may not look like you. There's a statement, folks, and especially here at the Olympia campus and at the Tacoma campus. I really want you to look into this. The statement is homo sum, humani nihil ame alienum puto. I am a human being. Nothing human can be alien to me. Now, when you, when you look in the encyclopedia for that name, Terence, with one R, you will see in italics, Terentius Affer. He was an African. He was sold to a, Ro a slave sold to a Roman senator. The senator freed him. He became the most popular playwright in Rome. Five of his plays and that statement have come down to us here, here, at this university, in this library. Five of his plays and that one statement have come down to us from 154 BC. This man not born white, not born free, or with any chance of ever achieving citizenship in the Rome of his day, said, I am a human being. Nothing human can be alien to me. Now, if you can say that, of course, that means that if a human being commits the most heinous crime, you can never again say, oh, I couldn't do that. No. You have to say, if a human being did it, I have within myself the components that are in that human being. Mine, I hope, are arranged a bit differently. <laughs> and if not, I intend to use my energies constructively as opposed to destructively. But if you can do that with the negative, look at what you can do with the positive. It means if a human being dreams a great dream, dares to develop courage 
the most important of all the virtues. Because without courage, you can't practice any other virtue consistently. You can be anything erratically. But to be that thing time and time again, no. Now, if you can do that, then if a human being dares to love someone, hmm, and has the unmitigated gall to accept love in return, it means you can do it. You see? You are liberated. I do the uh, convocation at Duke University every year for the last 15 years. And I told them if they didn't ask me, anytime they don't ask me, I'll be the tall black woman outside picketing. <laughs> I insist upon it. But I talked to 2,000 young men and women about to go into the university. Come in, they have already been registered and this is their first, this is the conversation. And I start by saying, ah, bye and bye, bye and bye. I'm gonna lay down this heavy load. That's that style with that. And I congratulate them for being in a university, in a place filled with uh, information, a place geared, built, founded to share information, a place planned, built to liberate each one of us from our ignorance. So here, you can drop it. At any moment, you can drop it. Just look at it. You know, I don't like them because my father never drop it. Oh, I don't trust because he's gay. You can't do it. And that's why you're here. Some people think, oh, I'm here, and then I'm going to meet that guy who's about two inches taller than I am, and he's going to, and, and he's going to be a lawyer, and he's going to be a doctor. She's here, I'm going to meet that girl, you know, she's a couple of inches shorter than I'm cute. And... <laughs> we're going to get that piece of paper, and then we're going to get some good jobs, and, and then we're going to buy a three-bedroom house with two-car garage, we'll have three and a half kids. And... <laughs> That's not really why you're here. You're here so you can become liberated. Thank you. Thank you. So, I'd like you to look up Terence. I am a human being. Nothing human can be alien to me. I know I'm talking a long time. But... I just have to tell you a couple of things. Um, at one point, I was in Yugoslavia. And I had been in France. And I knew I was going to Yugoslavia, so I reached out and found somebody to help me with Serbo-Croat. Because I wanted to have something to get into a country. I didn't want to go there and pretend I couldn't speak or pretend they ought to know my language. So uh, I studied uh, Serbo-Croat with a woman who taught me from French. Now her French was not all that smoking. <laughs> so the Lord knows what my Serbo-Croat sounded like. <laughs> but anyway, I learned enough. I was able to mumble around. And then uh, a young couple invited me to a party, some Serbo Croats. And I said, yes. The American State Department, which was underwriting largely the, uh, the opera I was singing in and dancing in, uh, had told us no Americans can go beyond four blocks, square blocks of the theater, four square, square blocks of the hotel. Well, yes, but I didn't think I would ever go back to Yugoslavia. And I was from Stamps, Arkansas, in San Francisco. 
I mean, and I'm black and six foot tall. I mean, wait a minute, no, I'm gonna go out here and see what's what. So I said, yes, I would come to the, to the party. The people came, this young couple in a pickup truck, there were about 20 people in the back. They pulled me up, we all stood up, and there was one bottle of Schlifferbits and it passed among us. <laughs> and uh, and we, they drove us out from Belgrade, out into the country, and I, my knees got a little water in them. I thought, oh Lord, have I gone too far this time. <laughs> we went all the way out and we came up to a house that looked like a Charles Adams house with little gorgoyles on little cupids and things, you know, but ooh. So I walked in and there was a uh, music on and it was mean to me. Why must you be mean to me? It was Billy Holiday. My lands. So I went in, I had a wonderful time, I ate with them and we drank and, and then a little old lady, just when we were about ready to go, she was, may have been about four foot ten came out of a door. She had on a robe homemade and slippers homemade. They looked just like the slippers my grandmother made for herself and a robe of felt. And she spoke to everybody and all these people spoke to her. Then she looked over in the corner and saw me and screamed. <laughs> my host came running, oh please, don't, please forgive her. She's ignorant, please forgive her. She's never said, I said, listen, if I had lived to be 90 with my people and never saw a white person and one showed up, <laughs> what? <laughs> I would be lucky not to faint. What are you talking about? So I just sat there and she was really frightened. And I spoke to her in several clothes. I said, good evening, mother. I'm happy to be in your home. Hello, mother. You have a beautiful home. And your children are very good, mother. Thank you very much for allowing me to be in your home. My, my cerebral cord was absolutely this, this primitive, but I continued. And I said, yes, mother, the food is very good, very good. And she kept inching. I said, won't you sit beside me, mother? She sat beside me. It didn't come off. <laughs> she pulled my hair, it didn't come out. She shouted, bring food. So her great granddaughter said, no, she's all, I said, no, it's okay. So I took a bite and she watched me chew it. <laughs> then she said, bring drink. Now, this, this is why you must learn to read. I had read that the proper way to drink sliver bits was there would be a little bowl of uh, apricot or, or peach or apple uh, confiture, pre preserve. You suppose, and a tiny spoon. So they take a bite of that, boop, down with the sliver bit, then another bite. That's not what we did in the truck. <laughs> but, but that's what I did. And she saw me and she said, good girl. My hosts were so glad, so thankful to me. So uh, we were getting ready to go when the door opened again and a man came out older than she and with osteoporosis, so he was old bent old. And when he didn't look over in the corner to where I was, I knew she was playing a joke on him. So he went out, oh, oh, speaking to everybody. And then he looked over and saw me and screamed. She said, don't be stupid. <laughs> ah. That's a good girl. He found his way. I said, Father, I said the same things to him I had said to his wife. And then he said, bring food. I said, bring drink to him. <laughs> He touched me, it didn't come off. I didn't. 
He asked me, listen, he asked me, who was your grandfather? Hmm. My grandfather, I told him. He asked, who was your great-grandfather? Who was his father? So I told him, my, my great-grandfather had been a slave in Tippa, Mississippi. He asked me, uh, what was his name? I told him, Thomas Bailey Johnson. He says, Thomas Bailey Johnson, Thomas Bailey Johnson. <laughs> he said, I knew him. <laughs> he said, he lived on the other side of the mountain. He was a farmer. He was a good farmer, but his father was better than he. Now, what would make this man, who had barely even gone into Belgrade, a Zagreb, he was a farmer. What would make him see me and say, this is a regular person? He had never seen a black person before in his life. Why? Because I had a little of his language. And because I respected myself and respected him. And I didn't feel offended because he had never seen me before. I accept that I am a human being and nothing human can be alien to me. And because of that, he accepted me. I wanted to read you so many poems, but okay, I'm going to read you this one. i tell you one, though, whether or not. This one about, just to make you laugh, because I love people who laugh. I never trust people who don't laugh, which I'm sure. <laughs> and act as if they put airplane glue on the back of their hands and stuck them to their forehead. And, uh, boring as hell. But I don't know if you're serious. I think if you're serious, you came here to make a difference. Uh, so you laugh as much as possible. Because everything will give you reason to bemoan your outcast state. I mean the newspaper. Don't pick up the telephone. You pick up the telephone and uh, say, oh, hi, good morning. And you listen and say, oh, God. Yes. Well, or uh, pick up your turn on the television, turn it on, everything. So when you can, you should laugh. Nor do I, I trust people who don't care for themselves and say, "I love you." I think no. You may want something, but you know you don't love me. No. The, there's an African saying, which is, "Be careful when a naked person offers you a shirt." Some years ago, I went into a health food diner. I was, I was a smoker. I'm not proud of that, but I was a smoker. I am proud to say and happy to say I'm over 20 years free of nicotine. Yes. And I will say this for you. I pray for you, any of you who has smoked, our, is smoking now. I hope you'll stop. And I hope you live long enough to say, I am 20 years free of nicotine. I mean, it is a killer. And a part of my problem with my knees is that my respiratory, my lungs are so bad that I can't even have a an operation which will take me deep enough for my knees to be repaired. You see? Please think about it. And as soon as possible, stop. And as long as you can remain stopped, do so. Okay, but I was smoking then. So here's this, the health food diner. I went into this health food diner 
tw over 20 years ago, 22, 23 years ago. And I wanted some rice and vegetables, as one does sometimes. <laughs> you know, I wasn't a vegetarian, but I wanted, and so I went in and I ordered it, and the woman walked away, and I reached into my purse and got out a package of unopened cigarettes. And this woman was back in seconds. She said, how dare you? That is so nasty. That is so filthy, filthy, filthy. Oh, you dirty, dirty. I said, wait, miss, please. Get a hold of yourself. <laughs> she looked like she was winding herself up to slap me or something. I said, I'm not the one. You really <laughs> Honestly, you don't want that. She said, it is such a nasty thing. So I said, listen, if you didn't want people to smoke, why don't you put some signs up? She said, we thought anyone who would come into a, a, a health booth. So I said, maybe everyone else. But mind you, that was over 20 years ago, and very few people really knew it. I said, and I worked so hard to pry myself loose from my illiteracy. I like to try all the time to see if I can read. No smoke. <laughs> Nothing I said would make her crack her face. She wouldn't laugh or love the money. She said, you've endangered everybody in this. Mind you, I hadn't even pulled that little piece of telephone off. <laughs> and, and the people I looked at, I said, these people just started coming here, didn't they? She said, no, these are regulars. They've been coming for years. This is the way the people look. <laughs> I said, I wouldn't tell him. <laughs> I'm not looking any better than that. What? <laughs> now, I, I have to tell you that the American Meat Packers Association didn't pay me a penny. <laughs> but they did publish 200,000 copies of this, of this poem. Mine. No sprouted wheat <clears throat> and soya shoots and Brussels in a cake, carrot straw and spinach raw. Today I need a steak. <laughs> Not thick brown rice and rice pilau and mushrooms creamed on toast, turnips mashed and parsnips hashed. I'm dreaming of a roast. <laughs> Healthful folks around the world are thinned by anxious zeal. They look for help in seafood kelp. I count on breaded veal. No smoking signs, raw mustard greens, zucchini by the ton, uncooked kale and bodies frail are sure to make me run to loins of pork and chicken thighs and standing ribs so prime, pork chops brown and fresh ground round, I crave them all the time. <laughs> Irish stews and boiled corned beef and hot dogs by the scores, or any place that saves a space for a smoking carnivore. <laughs> to invite me again. years ago, after I'd written the inaugural poem for Mr. Mr. Clinton, uh, the United Nations personnel, people, uh, wrote to me and telephoned me and asked if I would write a, a poem 
for, for all of us, for the world. And when I come to San Francisco and deliver the poem, well, God bless you. Well, I, I was overwhelmed because in 1945, when the uh, United Nations was being founded in San Francisco, I was 16 years old. I was pregnant, unmarried, and about to graduate high school. Six foot tall and black, even then. <laughs> and I had read that uh, simultaneous, simultaneous translators were being paid the unheard of amount, $150 a week, to work at United Nations. There had been statements in the San Francisco Chronicle, the Examiner, and the call bulletin. And I would go down and watch the people going into the building, United Nations building. I'd watch Miss, uh, Mrs. Eleanor Roosevelt with her friend, the black educator, Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune. I'd watch the people from India, and France, all those exotic places. And I would think, you know, if I wasn't black and six foot tall and 16 and pregnant and unmarried and uneducated, I could go into the, that building. Folks, imagine when I was asked, me, Maya Angela, 50 years later, to go into that building and deliver a poem to uh, the world, to the heads of state of the world. Look at it. See me now. I told you about that little village in Arkansas. I told you about being raped and being a mute. See now. How could I have made it without rainbows in my clouds? You see, some white ones, some black ones, some Asians, Spanish speaking. See, some fat ones, some thin ones, pretty and plain. See. That's who you are, and that's who I am, and that's what we can do to each other, for each other, and for ourselves. This is really, in truth, who we are. We shine so far beyond what we think are our limits. You see? So here is this poem. I'm going to give it to uh, Dr. Hargrove, Dr. Purse, and ask that you put it on your website. And I'll ask Dr. Mims to put it, have it put on the website. And it's available to you. If you think of me, please think of this poem. We, this people, on a small and lonely planet, traveling through casual space, past aloof stars, across the way of indifferent suns, to a destination where all signs tell us it is possible and imperative that we learn a brave and startling truth. And when we come to it, to the day of peacemaking, when we release our fingers from fists of hostility, 
when the curtain falls on the minstrel show of eight and faces sooted with scorn are scrubbed clean, when battlefields and coliseum no longer rake our particular sons and daughters up from the bruised and bloody grass to lay them in identical plots in foreign soil, when the rapacious storming of the churches, the screaming racket in the temples have ceased, when we come to it, when we let the rifles fall from our shoulders and our children can dress their dolls in flags of truce, when landmines of death have been removed and our aged can walk into their evenings of peace, when religious ritual is not perfumed by the incense of burning flesh and childhood dreams are not kicked awake by nightmares of sexual abuse. When we come to it, then we will confess that not the pyramids with their stones set in mysterious perfection, nor the gardens of Babylon hanging as eternal beauty in our collective memory, not the Grand Canyon kindled into delicious color by western sunsets, nor the Danube flowing its blue soul into Europe, not the sacred peak of Mount Fuji stretching to the rising sun, neither Father Amazon nor Mother Mississippi, who without favor nurture all creatures on their shores and in their depths. Those are not the only wonders of the world. When we come to it, we, this people, on this minuscule globe, who reach daily for the blade, the bomb, the dagger, yet who petition in the dark for tokens of peace. We, this people, on this moat of matter, in whose mouths abide cankerous words which threaten our very existence, yet out of those same mouths can come songs of such exquisite sweetness that the heart falters in its labor and the body is quieted into all. We, this people, on this small and drifting planet whose hands can strike with such abandon that in a twinkling life is sapped from the living, yet those same hands can touch with such healing, irresistible tenderness that the haughty neck is happy to bow and the proud back is glad to bend. Out of such chaos, of such contradiction, we find we are neither devils nor divines. When we come to it, we this people created on this earth, of this earth, have the power to fashion for this earth a climate where every man and every woman can live freely without sanctimonious piety, without crippling fear. When we come to it, we must confess that we are the possible. We are the true wonder of this world. That is when, when it looked like the sun wasn't gonna shine anymore. When we say yes, I will be a rainbow in the clouds. I thank you.